Today we're going to learn Eruvin Daf Lamed Ted. Um, today's shear is sponsored by Gabrielle and Daniel Altman in honor of the upcoming marriage of their wonderful nephew Eliyahu Stark to Ariella Weiss, Mazal Tov. Um, we are going to start uh, just a little update about the shearing for the next few days. Being this Rosh Hashanah, I'm going to start today after today's shear, start posting the next few days, and by tomorrow morning, I'll have the shearim up through um, through Sunday of Rosh Hashanah, so you can get a head start if you want, or find some time over over the next few days to to listen to the shearim or the next two days. Um, okay, we're going to start now, and in the Zoom, anyone who wants to join the Zoom tomorrow, in the Zoom, we're going to be doing the Sunday daf. Okay, today I'm going to already have posted Mem and Mem Aleph, and then Mem Bet. I'm going to put up to I'll teach in the morning tomorrow to the Zoom class and put it up. Um, and feel free to join the Zoom even if you haven't learned the previous shiurim. I think it should be okay. We're going to start now from the bottom. Okay, what's nice is that we're now getting to, we started with Chag and Shabbat being next to each other. Today we're going to get to the whole concept of two days of Rosh Hashanah, which is very nice because we're right before Rosh Hashanah. Um, we ended yesterday with this idea about when you go to do your Erev and you stand, Ma'arev Biraglav. Remember, there's two ways to do your Erev. You can put food or you could stand there for all of Ben Hashmashim. And then we said that there's a difference with if you're putting food, because there you have to establish and say, I'm making this for an Eruv. And then you can't do that on the second day. There's two days of, you know, there's a day of Shabbat and a day of Chag or the reverse. You can't put the food, right? If, if it's Shabbat and Chag, you can't even bring the food back there anyway. But if it's Chag and then Shabbat, where you could bring the food back, there you're allowed to bring food back, but you can't put food out from the start and say, I'm making this Eruv here now with food because that's really doing something. But if you just stand there, then it's okay because standing there is really not doing anything. That's where we ended yesterday, even though I kind of raised the question with Shomea Ke'onet. So, but here we're going to see another question. Amalei Rabba Barav Hanin La'abaye. If you would have heard what it says in this Braita, okay, we're three lines from the bottom of Lamech Chedam Abed, and if you remember, we learned this already. You can't go to the edge of your field, right, where you can't walk anywhere past there. You can't walk to the edge of your field and wait till Shabbat, right, right before the end of Shabbat, so that you can, you know, or go t- toward your field, I think it was, so that, right, you go to the edge of the tomb, so that you can go to your field immediately after Shabbat, or go to the edge of the city so that you can get to the bathhouse immediately after Shabbat. There, we don't allow you because of the issue of hachana, preparation. So why here do we say that your are for you just standing there and being konet with your raglaim, with your feet, is not considered hachana preparation because you're not actually really doing anything but standing there whereas here we don't allow you to just stand there you can't walk to the edge and be ready for the second shabbat's over and go out no it's not allowed and there it seems to be the exact same thing so he basically says had he known that there's no way he would have said this right he would have hadrabe he would have changed his mind so they're assuming he just didn't know about this bright so then they say velohi but in fact this isn't true he did hear of this Braita and he didn't change his mind. Why not? Because as the Gemara likes to do, we can make a distinction. What's the distinction? When you talk about the case of someone standing on the edge of the Tchum in order to get out the second Shabbat's over, what do you see? You see someone standing there and you see the second Shabbat's over, they walk right out and they go do something. It's quite obvious that he was standing at the edge of the Tchum in order to get out of the city. That is problematic because it clearly looks like he's doing hachana. Here we get into, again, what things look like, where we've seen, you know, married eye and all those things many times. But here, it's not clear if somebody just stands at the spot. Now, here you're, again, you're at the edge of the border uh, of the tomb, right? Because you want to be as far away as possible, to be konesh vita, far from your city. So there we're going to say that it's not mucha chamilta. It's not clear why you're standing at the edge there. Eat sorv rabbanan who, if you're a tamid chacham, amrinan is, why would anyone go to the edge of the border? You might say, what do you mean? You go to the edge, right ben hashmasha, which is the classic time where you want to be konesh vita, where you want to say, this is where I'm going to be for Shabbat. You see someone go all the way to the edge of the border. 
probably he's going to the edge of the border for Tom Shabbat purposes, right? He wants to be able to, to be Konesh Vita. But they say no, because there's lots of other reasons why you could end up at the edge of the border. Now, the assumption is, right, why would you go to the edge if you're not allowed to go any farther? So the assumption is, well, eat Sorva Merabban, and if he's a Tami Chacham, he must have been learning in his head or thinking about his learning and he got distracted and he ended up going out all the way to the edge. Okay, there, I, I think there's this assumption that there must be some sort of border or demarcation and that this is the border. So he must have been distracted and got there and all of a sudden realized, oh, whoops, I got to the edge. So you could say the reason why he's standing right there might not have to do with Tchum Shabbat. It just might have to do with the fat war, I should say, Kinyan Shvitad. He's trying to say, I want to establish this as my place. It could be just he got distracted and ended up wandering out there. You see that, by the way, the reality was different. You wouldn't normally find a Tamil Chacham wandering out of the city right when Shabbat started. Normally, they'd be on their way to shul. Right? And these days, it seems clear they didn't all go to shul necessarily, and it wasn't, you know, maybe that's why he was wandering, because it wasn't like there was necessarily shul. But we did see, remember, there's usually a drasha Friday night. There, there were obviously in different places, different customs. Okay, here's interesting. People either fall into two categories of the Gemara. Either you're a learner or you're an Ama'aretz, right? There's nothing in between, like what about the rest of us, right? But they don't have that. So either he's at Sorba Meribana and you assume he was busy learning and got distracted. Maybe his donkey got lost and he was wandering off to find his donkey and that's how he got to the edge of the tomb. Okay, so either way, you could claim that maybe that's not the reason, and therefore it's not noticeable that he's going there to be Konesh Vita, and that's why, um, that's why the, it's okay. Okay, again, we're talking about when it's Yantif and then Shabbat, and he's in Yantif afternoon, and, it's, and that's the issue. Gufa. Now they want to go more in depth into something we quoted before. Amar Rav Yehuda, Rav Yehuda said, Irev beraglav biyom rishon, ma'arev beraglav b'sheni. That's how we got to this. If you, on the first day of Yantif, right, Arab Yantif, you go to Banish Mashot, you stand on the border, then on Shabbat, you can do the same thing, right? On Erev Shabbat, you can go again. And that's what we just explained, because you're not really, it's not called Hachana. If, okay, what's the next case? Erev bepat biyom rishon, ma'arev bepat biyom shini. If you put your bread already the first day, you, again, you take it home and you put it back the second day, it's also not called Hachana, because you already... What is hachana? The hachana problem, and this is what we saw with the Marev Biraglav, it's going to the border and saying, I want to establish this as my place. Now, when it comes to the second day, you already did it the first day. And if you're just putting your bread back, you're not actually establishing anything. You're just reinstating what was already done. That's also okay. Irev bepat berishon. What if you started with bread? Marev beraglav basheni. Since we view Ma'arev Baraglav as less of an action, okay, and, and less symbolic also in nature, because you're really showing I'm living here. So if you started with bread on the first day, you can do the second day with your feet. Irev Baraglav Barishon, but the reverse is not true. If you went with your feet Barishon, ein Ma'arev Bepat Bashini, she'ein Ma'arvim Betchila Bepat. You can't put out bread and establish this is your Eruv on day number two if you didn't put bread on day number one. If on day number one you said, this is the place where I'm going to camp on, you know, for Chag, and you stood there, then that works for day number one. But if you come back the second day and you want to put bread down, that doesn't work. That's called Hachana because, again, putting down bread, again, there's a difference between putting down bread that was already there before versus putting down bread from, uh, right, uh, the first putting down of bread. Any putting down of bread is a symbolic act, right, the first time, and that's the problematic action which we're not allowing you to do on Yom Tov for Shabbat. Irev bepat biyom rishon, ma'arev bepat biyom shini. But Amr Shmuel uva ota hapat. Shmuel adds, by the way, if you started with bread and you want to continue and put your bread down the second day, it has to be the same bread. You can't put down a different food. Okay, it has to be returning the original food to the same place. If it's other food, it doesn't work. I'm a Ravashi. Ravashi says we can actually derive what Shmuel and Rav Yehuda said from our Mishnah explicitly. Daikanami matnitin dekatani. What does it say in our Mishnah? Remember? Ketsaduose. How do you do this? According to Chachamim, molicho barishon. You bring it the first day. Umachshichalav. And you wait till it gets dark. Vinotlo. And then you take it home after it gets dark. Uvalo. And then you can walk through using your Eruv. Basheni, on the next day, machshich alav, 
You go there when it's dark and you keep, right? You bring your food back. Sounds exactly like what they said. You bring your food back. You leave it there until it gets dark. And then if you want, you can eat it. Ubalo, And then you can walk where you want. So now we have a bit of a problem though. If it says what Rav, and Shmuel, what Rav Yehuda and Shmuel said explicitly in the Mishnah, because it explains exactly how it can be done, and not in any of the other ways that they described, right? It has to be the same bread, it has to be this. So you might say, why did Rav and Shmuel need to come? And as what were the rabbis maybe saying in the Mishnah that Rav and Shmuel were worried you might misinterpret? So they're going to say, Rabbanan, Domahatam, Tova, Kamashmalan. Maybe the rabbis were just describing to you. This is a good way to do it. We're giving you some tips and advice about how one can do this easily. But it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be done that way. Come, Rav Yehuda and Shmuel, and say, no, it has to be done in this way. Okay, new Mishnah, and here we get into Rosh Hashanah. So until now, we've been talking about, right, we had a whole thing, is it two Kedushot or one kedusha? But there we're talking about when it's two days, one of a Chag and one of Shabbat. Again, not like Rosh Hashanah where it's also Shabbat and also Chag, but we're really talking about one day is Shabbat, one day is Chag, like we talked about Shavuot, right, where they're next to each other. Now, what if we're talking about two days of Chag, okay? We're going to start with two days of Rosh Hashanah. We need a little bit of background. How is Rosh Hashanah and two days of Rosh Hashanah different from two days of, right, we already know that in outside of Israel, they keep two days called Yom Tov Sheni Shalgaliot for all the holidays. In Israel, we only do it for Rosh Hashanah. Why is that? Because Rosh Hashanah comes out on the first day of the month, which is a problem because on the first day of the month, when all the other holidays come out, usually in the 15th, right? There's, there's Shavuot, which is earlier, but all of them have enough time, at least for the people in Israel to have figured out when the new moon is. The rabbis would determine the new moon every month. They would determine which day is Rosh Chodesh, which then obviously affects the counting of all the upcoming days of the month. So they would do bonfires and people would know from the bonfires. But when it's Rosh Hashanah and it's the first day of the month, there's not enough time for bonfires to get around and for people to know whether it is or not. So in those days, even in Israel, outside of the Mikdash and the Mikdash surrounding areas, people would keep two days of Rosh Hashanah because they didn't know. And we're going to learn that even in the temple, there were times where they kept two days. Okay, because, and there was this... Um, the, this takana that they instituted at a certain point, there was one year where witnesses came very late. Witnesses would come from all around the city. Now, if they came later in the day, then what happens? So in the morning you do, right, they do the regular sacrifices. Now there's a special song that the Levies, the Levites would sing in the Beit HaMikdash, depending on, right, we know the Shir Shal Yom we have in our davening. It's all based on the days of the week. Also holidays, there were special Shir Shal Yom. So there was this one day where the witnesses didn't come. So in the afternoon, they did, with the, with the sacrifice in the afternoon, they did the wrong song. They did the song of the regular day, figuring witnesses weren't coming, and today wasn't Rosh Hashanah. And then it turns out the witnesses came and said it's Rosh Hashanah, and they messed up. And from then, they instituted, they, they were very upset about it. They said, we're going to say that if witnesses come from the afternoon, we're going to say that both days are sanctified of Rosh Hashanah. Okay, so... The whole question is going to be, if both days are sanctified, how do we view this sanctity, right? We generally say Rosh Hashanah is Yom Arichta, right? But there's different opinions about it. This is why it leads to Shechianu on the second night. Do you say a Shechianu or not? Is it two days? Is it, right? So there's a whole debate about that. Anyway, we're now going to say, um, so now we're going to talk about what you can do on Rosh Hashanah. And the whole debate here is really, do we treat Rosh Hashanah, is it like Yom Tov Sheni Shalgaluyot, that maybe today is sanctified and maybe it isn't? Or is it different? Is it just viewed as one long sanctity, in which case you can't play around with all sorts of issues that are going to come up in the Mishnah? The Mishnah is going to raise a bunch of different issues where if it's that we're not sure which day it is, then we, um, then we can play games with certain halachot. Particularly, we're going to start with Eruv. So Rabbi Yehuda Omer, so again, it's going to be different than the previous. The previous, both days were sanctified. It's just a matter, do we view the sanctity as one or not? Here, it's possible that maybe both days aren't sanctified because it's all, maybe it's today, maybe it's tomorrow. So that's Rabbi Yehuda's approach. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Rosh Hashanah Shaya Yare Shema Titaber. You're concerned that maybe it will be tomorrow and not today, right? It means, what's Titaber? It means, right, be pregnant, which means basically it will have an extra day which means that today, the first day is not going to be the first day of the month, of the year or the month. It'll be the following day. 
So, me'arev adam shnei eruvim. So, if you want, you could do two eruvs before Rosh Hashanah comes in. Ve'omer, eruvi ba'rishon la'mizrach, u'bashini la'marav, you could say, on the first day it'll be in the east, on the second day in the west. Ba'rishon la'marav, u'bashini la'mizrach, or the reverse, or eruvi ba'rishon u'bashini kibnei yuri. This is all like the previous Mishnah, right? They're giving all sorts of possibilities. Again, you have to wonder why they give all these possibilities, but I think they're just trying to say, Anything is possible. You could say, I want my Eruv to work on the first day. But the second day, I don't want an Eruv at all. I want to be able to go 2,000 cubits outside my city limits. Um, right? I can't help but think about, you know, how in Israel now we can walk only 500 meters on, on Rosh Hashanah and thinking about, you know, the boundaries and the measuring. And, and already people in my shul have been driving around trying to measure how far it is from so-and-so's house to the shul and can they go and... You know, it's this whole idea of measuring and how far can you go on a particular day. It's, it's really hard to not think about this when you're learning. Um, so now we say, right, or bashini, uh, or bashini, uh, bashini kivneiri, eruvi bashini, ubarishon kivneiri, right? Or I only want my Erev to work on the second day. On the first day, I want to walk 2,000 amma outside my city. Velo hodulo chachamim. But the rabbis didn't agree with him. Okay, this is very important. The rabbis didn't agree with this approach. We're going to see in the Gemara who the rabbis are. We're going to learn it's not, in fact, the rabbis. It's really Rabbi Yossi. We'll talk about this. Ve'onama Rabbi Yehuda. Also, he said, matna adam ala You could take a basket and make a condition about this basket. You have a basket of fruits that you didn't take trumot amasrot from. So again, you can't do it on chag, but if it's safek, you could. Rishon ve'ochlab, uh, you could do it beyom to Rishon ve'ochlab asheni. Okay, you can make a stipulation on Yom to Rishon, and that will allow you. We're going to learn that the stipulation also has to be on Yom to Sheni, and that will allow you to eat on the second day. Okay, we'll get into the Gemara. They're going to they're going to bring a bride that explains exactly how this is done. So we'll hold off. V'chem beitzah shenoda barishon ta'achel b'sheni. If you have a uh, an egg. That, that hatches on the first day, you can eat it on the second day because normally it's a problem of nolad. This wasn't in the world and you can't eat something that wasn't in the world before it starts. But since one day, right, if the first day is Kodesh, then you can eat on the second day because the second day is Chol. The second day is not Rosh Hashanah. If the second day is Rosh Hashanah, then on the, it was prepared from before Rosh Hashanah because the first day wasn't. So he says, again, the same thing. You're allowed to do this. And again, Lo hodu lo chachamim. The rabbis disagree about all of this. Last issue. This isn't Rabbi Yehuda anymore. This is Rabbi Dosa ben Hirkanos. And we're now talking about something a little bit different. We're talking about what you say in your tefillah. And it's just interesting to see, right? To us, this sounds very strange that they would do such a thing. But one could see why they would do this. And we'll talk about it in a minute. He says, Omer, ha'over lefnea teva b'yom tov shel Rosh Hashanah. If you're the chazan, okay? In those days, the chazan was the one who basically... Often in the, in the time of the Mishnah, the texts of the Tefillot were not set in stone. And whoever got up, he was the one who would kind of say the prayers. And people would usually answer Amen. They often didn't know how to say the prayers by themselves because the prayers weren't set like we have nowadays. And he would say the following. It's like on um, Shabbat we say, You notice this text doesn't appear anywhere in our prayer. Again, it says it by on Shabbat, but not in Rosh, Rosh Hashanah. Hachalitzenu Hashem Elokeinu, which basically means God should strengthen us. At Yom, He should strengthen at Yom Rosh HaChodesh Hazen. Now you're standing on Rosh Hashanah, so He's going to say two things. One is, you should mention Rosh Chodesh in your prayer, because Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the month. Okay, now we know nowadays we don't mention Rosh Chodesh, and this is going to be the whole issue on the, the next days on Daf Mem about do, are you supposed to mention Rosh Chodesh in prayer or not? Okay, and when the rabbis disagree with him here, do they disagree about the Rosh Chodesh issue or do they disagree about the stipulation issue? Now we're going to see. So what does he say? God, you should uh, strengthen us on this Rosh Chodesh. Im hayom im lemachar. Whether it's today or whether it's tomorrow. U lemachar. And on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, you should say, Huomel, right? We know in our machzer there's different texts for the first day and the second day, but I bet you never saw this, right? It doesn't change the wording of, right? Lumachar Huomel, im hayom im emes, right? You don't say, Vatitan lanu et yom azikaron azeh, if it's today or if it's tomorrow, right? Nobody says that in their prayer. But he suggests that that's what you should say. Im hayom im emes, either it was, it's today or it was yesterday. The rabbis didn't like this. You could probably see why the rabbis didn't like this because once you, right, it's what you say you start to believe. 
So if you start saying, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, people are going to say, why am I doing this? If I'm not even sure today's Rosh Hashanah, why? You can imagine also, it wasn't easy for them to keep two days of Chag, right? They're without refrigeration also and things like that. So you can imagine that it, people would start saying, why am I doing this? So why would he want to say this, by the way? I think he'd want to say it because if you're seeking truth, that's the truth. The truth is, right? It's If you're saying today is Rosh Hashanah and it's not really Rosh Hashanah, that's quite strange. So that's why he thinks that in your prayer, you should stipulate. Okay, whereas the rabbis don't agree with him. So again, we'll see the debate in the Gemara tomorrow about whether the rabbis disagree or not. Is it that they disagree about the Rosh Chodesh issue or is it that they disagree about the stipulation? From the structure of the Mishnah, it looks very clear that it's an issue of the stipulation because it just matches the structure of all the previous cases. So the Gemara starts off and says, Man lo hodulo. Who's the one who doesn't agree? Who are these rabbis who disagree with Rabbi Yehuda? And they ask this question because they obviously know that it's not all the rabbis and it's someone's particular opinion. Am Rav, Rabbi Yosihi. Rav says it's Rabbi Yosi. How do we know? Ditanya says on the following, Brayta, Modin chachamim le Rabbi Eliezer. Remember Rabbi Eliezer and chachamim yesterday? Two Kedusha, Rabbi Eliezer says. Right, so you could do two Eruvs. The rabbi said, no, we have to worry that maybe it's one sanctity, the Shabbat and Chag together, and therefore you have to be, you can only do one Eruv in one direction. So they say here that the rabbis say that Rabbi Eliezer would agree with the Chachamim, the, I'm sorry, the Chachamim would agree with Rabbi Eliezer that we view it as Shtei Kedushot, and you could put an Eruv in either direction, B'Rosh Hashanah, Shahaya Yarei Shema Again, we're going through the whole list. All of that is allowed on Rosh Hashanah according to the rabbis, which basically means the rabbis agree with Rabbi Yehuda, not like it says in our Mishnah. So who? But now we're going to see the end of that Brayta. Rabbi Yossi Oser. Rabbi Yossi forbids. So it must be when it says, Lo hodu lo chachamim, it must be Rabbi Yossi and maybe a few of his friends, you know, who kind of said they become the rabbis in the Mishnah who say, we don't agree with you, Rabbi Yehud. Now we're going to see in this bright a little bit of a discussion. Amar lahem Rabbi Yossi, Iya temodim she'im ba'u edim in amincha ulamala she'noagim oto yom kodesh ulamachar kodesh. But don't you agree with me? Don't you know that the rabbis instituted that if edim come from the afternoon on day number one, and the Edim get there late in the day and they say, we saw the new moon and it was last night, that even though theoretically they should make Rosh Hashanah that day, they decided to make it the next day. And not only that, but what would you think if they decided Mincha to make it the next day? So you'd think that they would then say, okay, everyone can go do whatever they want right now. It's not Rosh Hashanah anymore. But don't you agree with me that that's not what they did? And when they instituted that Takana, they said, that ordinance, they said, Today is going to be sanctified and tomorrow is going to be sanctified. In other words, again, because of all the problems with it, they said both days are going to be sanctified. Now, if both days are sanctified, what does that show? That it's one sanctity. If it's one sanctity, then you can't, right? Then you can't basically say this whole stipulation. What we would normally say for maybe Yom Tov Sheni Shal Galuyot, where there it really is because we're not sure which day, in Rosh Hashanah, it was instituted differently. It's not the same as Yom Tov Sheni Shal Galuyot. So Rabbanan, the rabbis say, no, 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 you misunderstood. We agree with you. It's true that if the witnesses come from Mincha Ulamala, both days are going to be sanctified. But it's not because it's all one Kedusha. Why is it? It's very obvious why. Because Hatam Ki Hecha Delola Zilzulebe. If after people spent the entire day treating it as Rosh Hashanah, and then it turns out witnesses came and they said, well, it doesn't matter anyway, right? If, or if witnesses haven't come till the afternoon, they're going to say, oh, forget it. This day isn't Rosh Hashanah, it's tomorrow. What's going to happen next year? Next year, they're all going to say, oh, remember, we spent almost the whole day thinking maybe it was Rosh Hashanah and it wasn't. What a mess. We're not doing that again. So that's why they said the whole day is Kodesh, but not because it's the two days are Vadai Kodesh. It's not that. It's not it's one long Kedusha. No, it's still because of this doubt. It's all because of the doubt, and it's not because of that. By the way, I want to point out one interesting thing. Nowadays, it's all different. Nowadays, we have a calendar, and they basically instituted Rosh Hashanah to be two days as, as remembering that in those days, everybody kept two days. But it's not exactly the same because the two days, and we're going to learn this much more in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, this whole long do you know about it? So if you don't get everything now, we'll get it later. But the two days that we keep, if you notice, it's not like two days of Rosh Chodesh. When we have two days of Rosh Chodesh, the first day of Rosh Chodesh is day number 30 of the previous month, and the second day is day number one. 
Rosh Hashanah is called Aleph and Bet Tishrei. It's the first two days of the month. So basically, that's it's very different than what we what were what it was originally. Originally, when they would keep two days and they would determine that the second day was the was Rosh, Rosh Hashanah, that would be the first day, and the previous day would be thirty. But nowadays, Elul is always twenty nine days. Rosh Hashanah is always on day number 30, which becomes day number one. It's not considered day number 30, so it's different, just so you should know that. Now we're going back. Now we're going to go to the fact that there's a bunch of cases in the Mishnah that all basically say the same thing. So the Gemara likes to always ask, well, why, are, why is Rabbi Yehuda saying the same thing in all the cases and the rabbis don't agree with him? It's all based on the same principle. So what do we need them all for? Utsricha. Why do you need these? Do you mean on Rosh Hashanah? Or it's actually not. It shouldn't say Rosh Hashanah. It should say Reisha. Okay, the Hagahoda Bach changes it. If you just had the case number one about the Eruv, because they're all Rosh Hashanah. If you just had the Reisha, which was about the Eruv, you would say Bahaka Amar Rabbi Yehuda, Mishum Deloka Avid Midi. There, he's not really doing anything. Now, what do you mean he's not doing anything? Well, first of all, he's not doing anything on Rosh Hashanah. Because he does it all before Rosh Hashanah. What does he do? He stands Erev Rosh Hashanah, right? Like this year, it would be Friday afternoon. He puts an Erev in one side. He puts an Erev on the other side. And he makes a stipulation. And all of that happens before Chag. So nothing's actually really happening on Rosh Hashanah. So you might think, because of that, Rabbi Yehuda allows it. But, Avalkankela, Demechse Kemetakin Tivla. But there it looks like when you say your second stipulation, we're going to see that you have to stipulate something on day number one and stipulate something on day number two, and then you can eat your food. So it looks like you actually took two more food. It looks like something's happening, even though it's not exactly, not necessarily happening, but it looks like it is. Therefore, you might have said, maybe Rabbi Yudah would think it's not allowed. And yet he still does, and that's why he needs to mention it in the Mishnah. And if you had those two, you would say, okay, those two fine, because there's no, there's no ulterior motives. There's no problem that's going to uh, arise from those two cases. But the egg situation where the egg hatches and you want to be able to eat the, what hatches from it. No. There, something comes out of the egg, right? So you might think that that, if we allow you, to eat a Beit HaShanolda on the second day, you might think that other things are allowed which are not. Like, for example, fruits that fall from a tree are not allowed. That's also no allowed. Or mashkim shezavu. That's if you squeeze lemons and you want lemon juice or you squeeze an orange. That's a problem. Again, there's ways it can be done. There's ways it can't be done. I'm not going to get into those details right now. But there, you might think you could do that on Yantith and you're not allowed to. So because it's similar to other situations that are forbidden, you might think, right? Maybe they would agree with the rabbis. Okay, so Beitza, where Lemigzarbe, maybe Rabbi Yehuda would say, it's no good. You can't allow this Beitza because it might lead to other things. But he still does, and therefore it's Sricha. So all the cases needed to be stated. Tanya. Now the Gemara says, brings the bright, and here we're going to see how you do the Trumona Maschot. Ketzad. Ketzad amar Rabbi Yehuda matne adam ala kilkala. How, in what, how did he explain that you can do this? So, so, um, so maybe I should read it differently. How did he say to do it? And now, okay, or maybe the whole thing is actually a question. How did Rabbi Yehuda say that and he can eat it on the second day? In what way? So here he explains. You have two baskets full of fruits that you need to take from. Omer, he stands there and he says, you have basket A and basket B. You stand there and you say, if today is Kodesh, right? What do we start to notice? If today is Chol, if today is a regular day, and it's not really Rosh Hashanah, and tomorrow is Rosh Hashanah, then right now I'm taking Truma from A, A will become Truma, and B will be my regular fruits that I can eat. V'im hayom Kodesh Chol, but if today is really Rosh Hashanah, and tomorrow's not, well then, then I'm basically saying nothing right now. It's meaningless because I can't do this. And then you say, so if in the event that today is Chol, this is Truma, you call it Truma, which is a very important aspect of Truma. You have to call it Truma. And then you leave it. You obviously can't eat it yet because maybe today is Rosh Hashanah. Then the next day, 
if today is Chol and yesterday was Kodesh, well then I'm going to do my Truma right now. Tehezo Truma also. Then basket A is going to be my Truma. Again, you're saying the same basket, obviously. And basket B, I can eat. Ve'im ayom Kodesh. But if today is Rosh Hashanah, then what I'm saying right now is meaningless. But what I said yesterday, right, is going to count. So the Korea Ale Hashem, and then you say, I'm making this truma in the event that today is not, or is a regular day. Ve'ochla, and now, since you said yesterday and you said today, and one of them is going to be relevant, then you can eat it. Rabbi Yossi Oser, but Rabbi Yossi forbids all this. V'chein haya Rabbi Yossi Oser, and now we're going to get to a bit of a problematic line. And thus, Rabbi Yossi forbade b'shnei yamim tovim shel galuyot. Now, until now, we've been talking about Rosh Hashanah. And it seemed like Rabbi Yossi was saying that Rosh Hashanah is unique because, again, all the things I described before. Whereas Yom Tov Sheni Shel Galuyot, you would think, would be different because there it's really safek, right? It's doubt which day is sanctified. But yet it says that likewise, Rabbi Yossi would forbid also in Shnei Yamim Tovim Shel Galuyot. In outside of Israel, on all the other holidays, he also forbade all of these things. So we're going to have a bit of a discussion in the next story. There's now going to be a story of the Resh Galuta, always interesting stories, and this is going to remind us of a story we had. I'll just refresh your memory. In the beginning of the Masechet, I think it was Daf Yud Aleph, we had a machloka between Rav Nachman and Rav Sheshet, but when you make a Tzurat HaPetach, remember the two, if you remember the beginning of Erevin, two beams, right, two, uh, sorry, two lechis, standing up and one cross beam going across, two posts and a cross beam. Does the post, the sorry, does the cross beam have to touch the post or can it be higher up? And Rav Nachman said it can be higher up, it doesn't touch him. Rav Shesha says no, it had to be touching. And if you remember, the, the Mavoy of the Resh Galuta had won the way Rav Nachman said. Rav Nachman was the son-in-law of the Resh Galuta. Rav Shesha told one of his guys to pull it down. The thugs of the Reish Galuta came and arrested him, put him in jail. Rav Shesha bailed him out of jail. And then the interesting part of the story, if that wasn't interesting enough, Rav Shesha then bumps into Rabbi Bar Shmuel, who said, and he says to him, oh, Rabbi Bar Shmuel, you have anything to say about, about this situ- You know, about have you learned anything about this? And, and he says, yeah, in fact, I learned. And he basically says that Rav Shesha is wrong. And Rav Shesha says, in that really amazing line, he says, listen, if you see the people of the Reish Galuta, please don't tell them, right? And we said, why did he say that? Well, right, he was probably scared of them, thought maybe they were going to put him in jail. He was embarrassed, maybe. In fact, the same story we're going to see, the same thing appears here today. I looked it up. There's another story with Rav Chista where it happens, and not with the Reish Galuta, but the same exact phraseology is used, where Rabbi Bar Shmuel brings him a bright. He says again, it's the exact same structure. Do you know anything about this? Do you have any bright toad about this? Apparently, Rabbi Bar Shmuel knew a lot of bright toad. And Rabbi Bar Shmuel quotes a bright and he proves Rav Chista wrong, and Rav Chista says, listen, don't tell my friends. And, and Rashi there says a little differently. Rashi is not always consistent with the Masef toad. He says, oh, um, don't, he doesn't want anyone to know because he's worried his friends are going to laugh at him or mock him. And, you know, it's, and it shows you the tension in the Beit Midrash and the fighting, the inner fighting between the rabbis, how scared he was of what they were going to do. So we're going to see the same exact story here. Although I'll already preface it by saying tomorrow there's a different version of this story, which doesn't include that whole end part about him meeting Rabbi Bar Shmuel, which is interesting in and of itself. And we'll get to that in the next Shi'or. So now let's see the story with all that intro. So there was a Ahu Bar Tavia de Atala Beresh Galuta de Itzdi Biyom Tov Rishon Shol Galuyot. There was a deer that appeared on the, in the house of the Resh Galuta that was trapped on Yom Tov by a non Jew. Now, non Jews are not allowed to do malacha for Jews, okay? But, and trapping is not permitted on Yom Tov. You're allowed to slaughter on Yom Tov for food, but you can't trap. So here he brought this deer that he had trapped on Yom Tov Rishon Shel Galuyot. So we're talking about not Rosh Hashanah, but Yom Tov Rishon Shel Galuyot. Ve'ishchit Yom Tov Sheni, and they shechted it on Yom Tov Sheni because they said if it was yesterday, right, then today we can eat it. Right? If yesterday, sorry, if yesterday, right, it's all the same. Yeah, right? if yesterday was uh, chol, then it was fine, and if today is chol, then it's fine. So either which way we can eat it. Rav Nachman and Rav Chista achlu. So in the Bei Reish Galuta they did this, and Rav Nachman and Rav Chista said, "Oh, I can eat this, no problem." Rav Sheshet lo achal. Rav Sheshet wouldn't eat it. So I'm a Rav Nachman again. Rav Nachman gets upset always when Rav, Nachman, when Rav Sheshet doesn't like the way he paskins for the house of the Reish Galuta, and he says, "My avid lachle Rav Sheshet lo achal bisra What am I going to do with Rav Sheshet? Who won't eat this meat?" Amar le Rav Sheshet. Rav Sheshet says, "Vehechi echol." How am I going to eat? 
Vitani isi, I'm really isi tane. Okay, it's either whether you say it as a statement or a kind of a question. Bechen haya Rabbi Yosi oser shnei amim tovim shal galiyot. Exactly what we just said, which is Rabbi Yosi forbids even on yom tov sheni shal galiyot. You can't just say if it's suffix, if it's this right. He treats it like Rosh Hashanah that it's all one kedusha. If it's one kedusha, this is one long day. I can't say, oh, maybe yesterday was chol when he did it. So Amar Rava umay kushya. Dilmahachikama. Rabbi says, why is Rabbi Yossi that bright to such a question? Maybe, maybe it's a mistake in the way we brought that source. And maybe the source really means the chain, which resolves our issue, which how do you all of a sudden take Rosh Hashanah, which is unique, and say it applies to Yom Tov Sheni? Rabbi says, maybe it meant, Rabbi Yossi oser b'shnei amim tovim shal Rosh Hashanah bagola. Maybe galuyot meant bagola. Bagola is a term that they use for outside of the temple on Rosh Hashanah. Because remember, outside the temple, they always kept two days because they never really knew, right? The word didn't get around so quickly. So maybe that's what he means. And then that's, right, that's Rosh Hashanah, which is different from Yom Tov Sheni. And Yom Tov Sheni, which means basically Rosh Hashanah could have eaten if that's really the version. So he says, right, I don't know why Rosh Hashanah didn't think so. Really, we could change the version of, you know, the bright really doesn't mean what we think it means. So then they say, but the wording doesn't match. It shouldn't say galuyot. Shal galuyot means the exile. It should say bagolame baile, which was more of an indication of outside the temple. So it doesn't really match the wording. But now we have another question against this. Maybe, and now he rereads this entirely, when he says, I'm just looking back about 10 lines where it says, he doesn't read that way. He says, It's a very convoluted sentence. Those are the important words. He says, and, and thus Rabbi Yossi said, when it comes to and the Isur, like the forbidding of it, he says it's like two days of Rosh Hashanah according to those who disagree with me. What he's basically saying, in other words, is the rabbis permit Shnei Amim Tovim Shal Rosh Hashanah. I don't think so. But when it comes to Yom Tov Sheni Shal Galiyot, I agree with them what they say for Rosh Hashanah. Okay? Which in a very convoluted way, I'll say it very simply, it just means that when it comes to Yom Tov Sheni Shal Galiyot, we treat it as sefeq and you can. Okay? So then, and why are they motivated to change what he says? Because it doesn't really make any sense. Why would he treat Yom Tov Sheni Shal Galiyot? Everyone thinks Yom Tov Sheni Shal Galiyot is suffix. It doesn't really make sense that his approach would be so far-reaching that he would even apply it to Galiyot. And therefore, they change it, which would basically mean that Rav Sheshet was allowed to eat the food, for sure, according to all this. And that's basically what they're saying. In any case, those are two comments about the story after the fact. And they basically say, we don't really understand the question, because you could just adjust that source and it must be Rabbi Yossi didn't really say what we think Rabbi Yossi said but now we're going to see what happens at the end of that story and here I already told you and you can see what's going to happen he finds Rabbi Bershmuel so Rav Sheshet says do you have any bright toad about the Kedusha of Yom Tov of these two days Tanina, he says yeah I have this bright toad that says and here's his version, which matches kind of what we just said. He agrees with the rabbis when it comes to Shneyamim Tovim Shal Galiyot, which basically means Rav Sheshet could have eaten that food without a problem because it was Yom Tov Shene Shal Galiyot. So Amr Le, which you already know what he's going to say, if you see the people of the Reish Galuta's house or Rav Nachman or any of the people who disagree with me, lo tema lehu velo midi. Please don't tell them anything that happened in the story. Okay? So, I'm not going to give it away. You can listen in tomorrow's shir for a possible explanation because it seems strange to a certain extent that the exact same thing would take place twice, right? That the same interaction and the same wording and all that, it does seem a little bit strange. So hold off and you'll see a different interpretation tomorrow because tomorrow we're going to see, or the next year, or that, there's a different version of the story. And in that version, this whole part doesn't appear. Okay, so we'll get to that tomorrow. But if we view our version, it basically seems like there's a clear, and which actually makes sense, and it makes sense with other sources, that there's a clear tension between Rav Sheshan and Rav Nachman and the people in the house of the Reish Galuta, which is ongoing and seems to be a bit of an issue. And even though to us in our modern eyes say, you know, admit your mistakes and go in public, 
we might just not really understand the situation, being that, you know, the Reish Galut already put his guy in jail before, and there was obviously a lot of tension and more than what we see, and, and it shows a lot about the tensions between rabbis and how it wasn't always hunky-dory, and, you know, we, unfortunately, we see the tensions nowadays also between rabbis with different opinions, and, uh, and it's a bit of an issue. Um, I see the question about, right, I didn't mention this, that Rav Sheshit was known to be blind. And was he blind at this point? It's a good question. And does that have any effect on the story? That's another good question. I don't know the answer to that. I don't remember the details about, did he go blind later? At what point of his life? And then obviously it's not clear when the story happened. He was blind from birth, which I don't recall. If he was, then obviously he'd be blind. I don't remember. I'm not really sure how that would affect the story, but it might be interesting uh, to think about if that would affect anything. In any case, that's the first version. Next year, you'll hear the second version and a possible explanation as to why it seems strange that this would happen another time. Maybe it didn't really happen another time, this whole interaction between him and Rabbi Shmuel. And again, it's interesting to see that the exact same wording appears by Rav Chista with someone else, which just might also teach you all. It's hard for me not to kind of give away, but that maybe this was a, what we call a tfus, right? A, a, str- a story, right? Not all the stories in the Gemara actually happened the way they did. And sometimes they just kind of use a, a certain frame of words and they put it into stories, even if maybe it didn't exactly happen in that way. Okay, we'll end here for today and uh, we'll pick up. Uh, so like I said, I'll put up later today the next two shirim and tomorrow we'll learn together Masechet, uh, Daf Mem, Mem, Bet. Uh, right? Mem, no, sorry. Mem, yeah, Mem, Mem, Aleph, Mem, Bet is for Sunday. Okay. Am I right? Am I confused? One second. Lamitet is Friday is Mem, Saturday. Yeah, we'll learn Mem, Bet together. Okay.